I am John Colasacco, uh, Deputy Director of the Jewelry Department at Skinner. And I am introducing Gloria Lieberman, uh, with whom I have worked since 2005. Uh, so we've uh, had some many great jewelry finds together. Um, these are some of our favorite pieces over the past several years. Um, we, we worked to pick some, some highlights that we really liked and um, want to have a nice casual conversation about where they came from and a little brief history. And uh, what Gloria doesn't know is I've picked a few pieces that um, are gonna be a surprise to her just to keep it fresh and interesting. So without further ado, I think we can get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with our first image here. Whenever it's ready. First one's always shy. Let's try that again. <laughs> Didn't allow for the te technical difficulties here. Okay, let's give that just a minute. Ah, here we are. So this piece is, I think one of my favorite pieces that we've ever sold at Skinner. It's uh, this Boucheron Art Deco Devant de Corsage. Um, designed by Lucien Hertz uh, for the 1925 Exposition Universelle des Arts Décoratifs or the Art Deco exhibition. And, and that is really what started Art Deco. It was the modern design show. There was architecture, there was jewelry, there were deck arts. Um, and, and, and this piece was there. I mean, I just, I just think it's, it's just spectacular. Uh, Gloria, what do you think? Well, I think, you don't realize how large it is. This is quite a large piece of jewelry. These were meant to be seen from afar and they were meant for the exposition. So they're gonna be larger than life. I think a lot of this type of jewelry was done by many houses and each of them had a different interpretation. Um, I love the gadrooned deco outside of it. And this is sort of curvaceous, less linear than a lot of the other art deco pieces. Um, but all this great jewelry that came our way, it's really the people that own them that were just as fascinating and interesting. I mean, who would have bought this? You know, you know, someone who had either great style and a lot of money. So that combination always makes for great finds for us. Um, so, I mean, these all have stories of how they came to us and who bought them. So I don't know if we have time today to tell all of these stories. But with this piece came some other fascinating jewelry. In fact, I think John, you picked another group from the same collection. I, I, I certainly did, I did. Um, and this, this is one of those things that um, it, it literally just walked in the door. It was, it was one of those just awful rainy New England days. Um, I, I don't even remember what time it was. It was just gray all day and we got the call from reception that there was a walk-in appointment in the lobby and you never really know um, one of the things that i love about what we do is i mean they don't walk in every day but but things like this do <laughs> do walk in the door sometimes and and it just was such a surprise to see something like this just completely come in without even expecting something like this but you know, it's interesting too, John, about the little bit of the story is that you would never think someone that owned this needed money. <laughs> so, well. you know, that's the other part of the story is why would anyone want to sell this? And this was actually the daughter of the owner who passed away and she said, I need to pay taxes. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, and this sold at that time for almost 200,000, if I recall correctly. Yep. Uh, 189,000. Yeah. Um, and the original estimate was 50 to 75. Right. Um, and I think, again, today would probably go for double because these things become even more important and they're, they're rare. And the more you're in the business, when you see this stuff, you say, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. So this was a, a fantastic piece of jewelry and it had a, a really good story. It did. And, and we did get um, confirmation from, from Boucheron that this was in the exhibition in 1925. Uh, it just, 
which is such a really rare thing. Um, and keeping with our brooches, I think, Gloria, this is one of your favorite pieces. Yes. Oh, yeah. This was um, an incredible piece of jewelry that actually I looked at many years before we sold it. And, you know, someone comes in and then she wanted to have it appraised. And this, of course, is by another great French house, Chaumet. Um, again, oversized. This was probably, what, almost four inches. It was, and, and that's yeah, quite I mean, large. Again, the, these are rare pieces. The combination of emeralds, diamonds, ruby, and a little bit of the onyx, true art deco. Um, and when she took it away, she just wanted to have it appraised. I said, I have to be able to sell this piece of jewelry. I don't know, how long did it take, John? 10 oh, years, 12 years? I think so. Well, well, let's see, we sold it in 2011. Um, yeah. And I hadn't started yet. This was, yeah, I think before, we before you came, this yeah. for a while. So yeah, Th this was one of those that used to keep me up at night, you know, dreaming about it. Is this ever going to come? And then when we finally got it to sell, the uh, this was bought by the owner's father. And it was actually bought in an auction in New York back in the 60s. They had the auction catalog of the piece. It was in a famous sale. And we act, I actually decided to give it the same lot number. Do you remember, John? I said, we have to yeah. pick the same lot number. Um, uh, has many backstories about the back and forth coming to us, taking it away. It was one of those pieces that I just willed it to come back. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. When it finally sold, I, it sold for what? 385,000 something. 385,000 in 2011. Yeah. 150 to 200,000 was the original was the estimate. estimate. Yeah. But I mean, how, how do you even estimate something like this? It's, you don't. It's such a rare thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the carved emeralds are fantastic. Um, I mean, it's very much, uh, it, it, it easily could have been with the Boucheron at the same show. Um, and it, it's, yeah. I would want to wear that just right, right yeah. on the shoulder as an yeah, epaulette. It's an epaulette. It's an epaulette. Suit. It's yeah. wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, and, and you will see that theme of carved emeralds again and again. And I think, John, you picked some carved emeralds I, that we saw. I sold. certainly did. Yeah. I certainly so did. You, you will see that theme. And didn't, if I remember correctly, didn't um, she used to wear to play cards with the neighbors? Oh, yeah. Up in New Hampshire. That's what you wore. You would never <laughs> expect to see that at a card game, right? <laughs> yeah. Not? She said that everyone thought it was costume jewelry. <laughs> yeah. So let's turn in a completely different direction. And this is a bin approach by uh, Alexander Calder, uh, actually. Um, that is another piece that, you know, how do you estimate? It's, it's so different than the, the previous two. And yet at the same time, it, it's just, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, this was a commission by Henry Sales Francis, who was the curator of paintings, uh, prints and paintings at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, and he commissioned it for his wife. And one thing that I love about this, we're gonna bop ahead just a moment. We actually had the letter from Calder to Francis. And I love the shade in this letter. It says, I, I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but it says, I never heard whether you received the pin or not, or whether or not it was satisfactory. I trust both, but would you kindly let me know that it did arrive, mailed November 24th. <laughs> so it's just got that. The letter to me is, is it, it sometimes, you know, we, we never get uh, this, uh, lots of documentation and this this piece actually had it um and what we're missing here is the the sculptural nature of this piece that that wire work is actually quite raised um and it really is something that you know you could wear that I, i'm going to say i think it would be very much at home with with the pieces like the boucheron uh we we sold that with an estimate of 20 to 30 for one hundred and eleven thousand dollars in 2013 mm -hmm. Um, it's just a great piece. What do you think? Yeah. 
Well, also, I think what people don't realize is Calder, you know, one of the, the signs of his jewelry is that he didn't use any tools. It's all wrapped wire. So look at this. This is continuous wire just going in spirals. I don't know if you can see it. And then just rewrapping the pin stem. See that closure to the left, the silver. That is the wrapping of the pin stem. So it's all continuous. Very interesting and so much a part of what Calder did with his jewelry. And I love that it's not initials, you know, it's just pure movement and has a very sort of ethnic earthy feel to me. I, I love, we love this piece. And of course the letter, I mean, who crosses out a word? I usually write like that and will cross out something and then not rewrite the letter. It was so casual and so spontaneous, which is what his jewelry is about. And this was, I think, one of my favorite Calder pieces that we ever sold for a brooch, not a and great you, grand necklace. No, you sold, you've sold quite a few over the yeah, years. Yeah, we've sold quite a few, but this, this is so charming and so right on. I love it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so I just want to, at this point, remind everyone that they can ask questions. Um, there is, there should be a feature uh, along the top or the bottom of your screens, um, and we will be doing a Q&A later. So if anyone needs more clarification, that's a good question. Um, so let's move on. So of those three brooches, Gloria, what do you want to wear after the pandemic? What's, what's, what are you taking out to a soiree? All three. <laughs> That's <laughs> all I can say. This is big. Go big. We have go to big really or go celebrate. Home. <laughs> yeah. So here's our letter again. And then here we are. This bracelet is Cartier. And it's, again, one of, I think we both agree, this is one of our favorite bracelets that, that we sold. Um, and a lot of this bracelet is the provenance. It was, it was from the estate of uh, Hope Goddard Islin, and she has a fantastic story. I, I, we could do a whole talk on, on her. Uh, she was the first woman to compete in the America's Cup, big yachting family. And one of her claims to fame was that she defeated the Russian Grand Duke Michael at a golf tournament in 1900. And I don't know, uh, I'm sure this is true. He got so mad that he destroyed his golf clubs. So she was, she was quite the jewelry collector. And, and I think her taste really, really comes through in this bracelet. Yeah. I think this, this, as you know, is my favorite all time Art Deco bracelet. You said to me, pick one, this would be it. And what I love about it is the way it's conceived. It's, it's just a black cord. Can you imagine being threaded through all these little uh, loops with little tiny diamonds and the closure is like a Chinese button. It almost, it's, if you think of Art Deco, one of the themes was Chinese and this has a Chinese feeling to me. And it's such a chic bracelet. As John said to me, Gloria, don't you, don't you remember that this would turn around and twist and it didn't fit right? Maybe it was an armlet. You know, my opinion on this, it's so chic. You can wear it anywhere. You can wear it with your ripped jeans. It can be upside down. I think it is the coolest of the cool of Art Deco. And it brought at that time, what, 250,000 close to that? 250,000. And if you said to me, what would it bring today? Easy 500,000. It is rare and so cool and so chic. And she probably wore it to that golf match. <laughs> I hope so. It's a, no, it's a great bracelet. I mean, I think, I think sometimes buyers get hung up on gems and diamonds and materials. And, and when you try to say to someone that what absolutely puts this bracelet over the top, it's black cord. And it's just, everything about this is, is, is great design. Um, I, just, I just love that. It, well, you know what? Because it's got very little intrinsic value. So basically you have to judge this on sheer design. And what is the price of sheer design? That's what this is. Much like the Calder. It's got Absolutely. no intrinsic value. Absolutely. So 
John, find me another one. Okay, I'm on it. <laughs> okay. And then let's turn again. This bracelet, and we had to do two image of this one because I don't think pictures will ever do the scale justice. This bracelet came from the same consigner who had the Boucheron brooch. And so one, one family, two completely different styles. Although it makes sense if you're buying jewelry in 25, this is only 1940. It's still in your jewelry buying career, if you will. Um, but I just love this, this combination of the citrine, the diamonds, the bangle, the chunkiness. I love everything about it. Yeah, it's very 1930s, late 40s. But, you know, interesting, this is Cartier. It's Cartier. Um, and what's interesting is I remember when someone came to look at it, they said, you know, but this says 14K. How could Cartier make something in 14K? I said, well, it was made probably in for the American market. It was probably the war years. And um, they weren't thinking about the 18K so much. Unlike in France, they would not, never make jewelry unless it was at least 18 carat. So this is an American piece. And again, this is all about design. It's unfortunate we can't see the scale of it. And the rounded little shoulders of the diamond sort of hugging this giant citrine. It is just, again, a very beautiful and chic, elegant piece of jewelry that was done for the late 30s when huge shoulder pads were in. Remember, the scale of clothing was different. So this was a piece that was of the period and quite spectacular. I forget what that's all, almost 100,000. Yeah. Close 94, to it. yeah, 94,000, yeah. uh, the original estimate 15 to 20. Again, yeah. how do you estimate this? Intrinsic yeah. value is, is not, it's not that much. Yeah, absolutely. But I did, I, I just, I just love this bracelet. And, and, and another piece that I just added on just for a little bit of fun, because I loved it. This bracelet, it's, it's not, uh, it's contemporary. It's Seaman Sheps called the, the fifties bracelet. And when, when I was putting a lot of these slides together, I just found myself wanting to see more big, chunky, gold, jemmy jewelry. And, and I don't know if it's just the buzz in the air about, you know, maybe getting over the hump of this pandemic that I just wanted big and I wanted gemstones. And, and this bracelet by Chefs just really did it for me. Um, we sold that for, let's see, $15,000 in 2017. And I, I think that bracelet would be very much at home with some of the others. I really do. I love the, the shape of the stones. It's very, um, would you say it's a little Renaissance style? Baroque yeah, that, that's a good way of putting it. It's, it's layering of colors and stones. Um, it's an interesting piece. It looks like, a, you know, at the end of a jeweler's day, all these stones left <laughs> over. What am I going to make with it? This is actually harder to put together and make look great than it looks. It looks like I could do it, right? We'll just take a coral, we'll take a citrine, a garnet. But, you know, think about it. It's all the layering and sort of the positioning of the stones and it works. You know, Absolutely. again, these are not high value, but think about the design and the manufacture. And it, I don't know if you can see that it has a hinge on one side so that it flips open on the right side, you can see the hinge. So then you clamp it on, it's almost like a clamper. So it hugs you, beautifully manufactured. Interesting. Absolutely, Absolutely. a uh, Byzantine was what I was looking for. It's got that Byzantine look. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. you see those frescoes, I mean, uh, uh, mosaics, it's, it's just something that, I don't know, I, I feel like, I feel like that's what I want to wear going forward. But, you know, again, it's just great design. Um, so we've done brooches and some bracelets. Um, let's move on to necklaces. So this piece, what we sold that in 2010. And this descended in the family of Samuel Colt of Colt Revolver fame. Um, he was one of the wealthiest businessmen in America in, in the 1850s in the United States. And this necklace was purchased for his wife uh, on the occasion of their wedding in 1856. And we actually did a little more digging on this one. And it turns out they bought a necklace 
at the time of their wedding from Tiffany and Company. So it's not signed, but this necklace was most likely retailed by Tiffany in the 1850s. The, let's see, what do we have for diamond weight? It's about over 30 carats of diamonds. And just, I think, classic diamond necklace. I love the way the star, they're, they're star set. Um, you've got that, that enamel in there. Um, this would absolutely be a showstopper anywhere. What do you think, Gloria? Um, yeah, I could see myself wearing that, definitely. Um, I, I also to mention, <laughs> it, ended up, it ended up in the Museum of Fine Arts uh, permanent collection. So it's on view. So if you'd like to see this in person, um, their jewelry collection is quite beautiful. And this is one, and one, a historical piece. It's from a historical American family. Um, but I guess if you uh, were a gun manufacturer, you could buy anything you wanted. And this was probably a very expensive piece of jewelry. We ended up selling it, what was it, over 200,000? This one, what, we sold that for- I think so. I uh, 200,000. Yeah. And I actually, uh, in one of the Tiffany reference books, they said that Colt bought a necklace. So this would have been with uh, earrings and there was also a dress set um, that at some point in its history got turned into a, a, a spray brooch. And the total price, what do you think it cost in 1856? Mm, 1856. <laughs> what? I don't know, John. That's a good so, question. 10,000? Oh, oh my God. It's like you've been doing this forever. $8,000. See? So yeah. $8,000 in 1856 yeah. would have Now, been I could see this fortune. easily as a dress set, John. Absolutely. Perfect. Think about it. Buttons, the small ones, and cuff B. And I'm sure they look great walking down the aisle together. <laughs> it would have been fantastic. I, I love it. Get your diamond studded revolver yeah. and you're all set. You're all um, done. And just for a bit of fun too, I just wanted to compare it to this necklace. And this is mm -hmm. a contemporary piece. Uh, this is, we sold that in 2006. And this was designed by Marilyn Cooperman. And I just love contrasting the two pieces because this is a modern piece. And uh, the story goes that, that a friend of hers had a Georgian necklace that she really liked. And her friend was named Jody, So she made the Jody necklace. necklace. And I just, again, when we're talking about coming out of a pandemic, going into the future, mm -hmm. I just wanna see more color. I love the green, um, you know, the, the cross drop is removable. Um, and I just love the way she she designed this necklace. And and Gloria, you, you knew Marilyn, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, she, she was a, a very special person. She was so creative, loved color. She passed away this year um, and, when I got this necklace from her, she had one in sapphire that she had just sold. And this one was left. And she said, you know, Gloria, may maybe, maybe somebody special will buy this. I love this necklace. Um, and of course, the MFA bought it for their, per their collection again, because she was an important woman designer, contemporary designer. But you know what? What I think you have to think about when you look at this necklace is the match. We always talk about the match of stones. If these stones did not match well, this would be not so interesting. It would, it would, this is a whole, think about it. And when you look at really fine jewelry, just even Pave diamond jewelry, the match of the stones is critical. So this tells me that this all came from maybe one piece of rough that someone was just cutting stones and uh, Marilyn probably saw this, we call it a layout and designed this very balanced sort of old school necklace. You could see this in paintings, John, you couldn't you? Absolutely. Except they wouldn't Absolutely. have a class. They would have had a ribbon. You know, if you, in the Spanish paintings of royalty, they would be wearing necklaces like this with a ribbon in the back. I love that. Um, but this is really a beautiful piece of contemporary jewelry looking older by a woman designer. Yeah. I just, again, it's the colors for me. I, oh, I yeah. actually, um, I think the, the, the Malta Sapphire one, I, I've seen the Malta Sapphire one. Um, 
it's it's another great use of color. She she really knew how to use color. She yeah. knew how to design jewelry. She knew how to match gemstones. She um, actually worked for Vogue in Canada. She was Canadian. And I didn't know that. she was she was head of their pattern making. She did all the patterns for Vogue way back when. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And then let's now for something completely different. This is by Castellani. Uh, we have sold a few of these grape cluster necklaces over the years. I think this is the third one, at least in, 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 in my time. This is the most yeah. recent one. Um, and we sold this one for 43,000 in 2019 um, with a, an original estimate of 15 to 20,000. And the consigner actually bought this from, from Wartsky. And even though it's unsigned, we know it's Castellani. The workmanship is so distinct. Um, and it, it, it really is a great example of this archeological revival style from the 19th century. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, is, is, is this a copy of an ancient prototype or is this an interpretation? Um, but I, yeah, I, I, do I, think I think this might be an interpretation. I don't think it's an exact copy, mm -hmm. but he, of the ones I've sold over the years, the grape clusters were different stones two different colors. I love the red ones. We had some that were really red and then light gray, and this was somewhere in the middle. So we do see them with different colored stones. And sometimes we, we've had them where they were actually signed with the interlocking Cs. This one was not, but uh, we, were, we were confident it was. Absolutely. And, and you know, of, of the, the, the revivalist jewelers, I've always loved Castellani. Uh, the, the interpretations of the classical style. They, they look as fresh today as they did in the 19th century. Of course, in the 19th century, they, they would have had what, piles of piles of jewelry. Um, it, it reminds me of that, that um, uh, comic, not comic strip, but you know, and it's, it's a woman in the classical style and, and she is- Oh, covered. Punch and Judy. It's yeah, yeah, you know the one I'm talking about, and yeah. she's got hairpins and bracelets and necklaces, and it's just, it's just, you know, total over. Totally it's over the, the, top. the yeah, it's overkill. Over the top. But, but this by itself, I mean, it's, yeah. it's perfect. I, I, I would, I would wear it under a shirt collar. Um, I, I think it's such a great thing. Um, but of the three necklaces, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm moving from the diamonds. But I'm really gravitating toward the Cooperman. I, I think that might be my favorite of, of the three. I, yeah. I, it's just, I'm just responding to the colors so, and, and the design of that. Mm, One of my, okay. my favorites. But moving on here, this is another, Gloria, I think one of your favorites. Yeah, yeah. it's another one. Yeah. Another piece that I appraised before we got to sell it and was dreaming about it. This was, you know, I had like, I've had probably three to four pieces over my career at Skinner's where you've seen something and saying, I, I just want to live long enough to be able to sell it. And uh, when these came back and were available, I, I just couldn't get over it. I think these are spectacular diamond earrings. They're everything that diamonds are not supposed to be. They're not well matched. They're kind of flat. One's a little bigger, one's a little smaller, but on they are spectacular and if they were fully faceted faceted they would be so brilliant you couldn't wear them but these have that quietness where with a tur black turtleneck that's what i want to wear at night having dinner john i love these these sold what for 160,000 160,000 one nominal yeah 160,000 and you know and and the diamond weight the those two diamonds i believe oh, only only 10 10 10 carats um total weight oopsies we were back yeah because um, they were they were pretty were, flat were 10 carats yeah. total weight they, they were quite flat um but no those those are i mean just yeah. i love that that cartier motif up top it's a little it's bell. so yeah. that great bell of poke cartier yeah. yes. um and, and we did sneak forward a little bit because I wanted to take but, another John, turn. I don't, go back to those earrings. Those are the earrings, the, the Cartier diamond ones that I want to wear with that Cartier bracelet. 
It's very <laughs> quiet, very, very subtle. understated, subtle. Absolutely. <laughs> well, these, these are far from subtle. Uh, these are Victorian fishbowl earrings from the 1870s, from that period when I, I think, you know, would you say that that's probably one of the most creative periods for, for earrings? Um, it, it's, they did so many whimsical motifs. I think these are the nicest that Yeah, that they, these I were spectacular. Spe when we saw them, we were like, oh my God, we've never seen anything like these, this fishbowl, this reverse crystal. I mean, everything was here. They were spectacular and they brought a spectacular price. The first time, the woman that owned them, uh, she had them for a few years and she said, they're just too heavy for me. So she said, am I ever gonna get my money back? I said, maybe we can always hope. And do you know what? They brought 10,000 more than she paid. They are, were so great. Whoever saw them just said, I've never seen anything like them. They're fantastic. Love them. They're, they're wonderful. And it's, you, you almost have very like these Etruscan revival motifs with the coils on the top. And it's, it's, it's a salute to Victorian aquarium culture. Um, you know, these are completely whimsical. I love them. It, it's, it's a different, it's a stretch. I mean, it's a totally different yeah. hearing, but, but at the same time, I mean, yeah, I, these, me, these are the more bowls. for I love the yeah, these are more for Maine, summer home in Maine, right? <laughs> That's what you'd be <laughs> <That's> wearing. <right. laughs> Definitely. Go out to the legal seafoods. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to, so we've done the various types of jewelry that we like. Um, I think now it's time to start getting into what were some of the heavy hitters, the big items that we've had over the past few years. And I want to start with this. And this ring, this antique sapphire and diamond ring, it might not seem like much, but it's a 5.43 carat cashmere sapphire. And we always joke that, you know, we, we never, no one ever calls to make an appointment with a cashmere sapphire, do they? they it's always, they come in the door and they have this distinct color, don't they? They, you just, you just kind of know when you look at it, this is a cashmere sapphire. And, and this to me was one of the, the nicer ones we've ever sold. Um, it, it had everything, it had this great provenance from Howard and Company, which was a New York jeweler that uh, went out of business in the twenties. Um, and, and the cashmere sapphire mine itself is basically depleted in the late 1880s. Uh, you know, that, that um, what do they call it? The old, is it old, old mine? The old mine material just can't be replicated in the new mine material. Uh, there's so much about what makes a gemstone rare and valuable. And this just has it all. So I just, I just loved that, loved it. I would, I would see, I would wear, that could be your everyday ring for about $543,000 in 2015. Yeah, color is a whole other. What do you love about the cashmere? Uh, it's a whole That's other a totally situation. Cat, they're cashmere's of many c different kinds of cashmere colors. You know, my favorite are the really sleepy old mine uh, I, that are very hard to come by. The only thing I can say is the twin stone ring we had. That cashmere twin stone had two cashmere's that were not uh, oval or round. Mostly you get them in oval, but these were squares. It's very hard to get a really beautiful cashmere stone in an emerald cut or a square cut. And those were incredible, the pair, because the, the intensity of the color was even throughout. Uh, a beautiful color and color is very personal. You know, some people say, I, I don't like the bright electric blues. I like the softer, I like the darker. I like a different mask over it. Um, it is quite personable. What you get a fabulous cashmere, everybody likes it. It has this universal appeal, this, this sleepiness, and it's just, it really just takes your breath away. So absolutely, it's kind of personal. You know, each one is a little different for me. I react to them differently. 
Oh, absolutely. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, I feel like when doing a talk like this, you feel obligated to talk about the Kashmir Sapphire, but I, I'm sure many of you are looking at this picture thinking, well, that doesn't, doesn't look so great. And one of the things about them is I find they just never photograph well. I, I, they, when you see them in person, it's, it's just so tactile. It's so personal. And they, they have that, that special glow that makes them distinctly cashmere sapphires. And, and it's just one of those things that they, they always come in. I mean, at 543 and 543, a hundred thousand a carat, it, it's, it's very hard to, to find these stones. And, um, and when we do, there's always a lot of interest. Um, but I think I'd like to move on to probably the biggest lobby surprise um, that, that I think we've had. And this, this diamond, heart-shaped diamond, 31.25 carats. It is 31.25 carats. Uh, this consigner called and said that they had um, some David Webb cufflinks and other jewelry that they'd like to bring in. Well, this was the other jewelry. And opening the box and seeing a diamond of this size, and, and, and you just know, you just know it's a diamond. There's, there's, there's no question. Everyone says, well, how did you know it was real? Like, oh, you just, you, you just know. And I just remember looking at it and excusing myself to go get Gloria. And it just, that wound up being, uh, what, what did we take that in for? It was uh, two to three million was the initial estimate. And we wound up yeah. selling it for three point Just under four. Yeah, yeah, just under four exactly. million. Now, here, here's a good example. If you look at this photograph, right? You're saying to yourself, it's got this giant culet. I'm looking right through it. It looks like it's cut in a weird, funky way. It's not a perfect heart. You know, you can start saying, who's going to, how can you wear it? It's so big. What, what are you going to make out of it? You're looking at all the things that are wrong with it. But this was a pure white, white stone that when you saw it, it just really took your breath away. And of course, uh, when people came to see it from all over, they just couldn't get over the beautifulness of the material. It was all about this material. I mean, it wasn't, we had it certified. It was a D color. D color, uh, DVBS yeah. two, but who cares yeah. about clarity? It was a D yeah. color. It was, and it was just spectacular stone and people just came just to see it. You know, everyone was like, I've got to see the stone. I've got to see it. Um, and what can I say? Again, this was owned by a very, very famous family. You had to be wealthy to buy this whenever they purchased it way back when this was not just available. And uh, the family name, I, I don't remember if we wanted to, we should reveal it. I mean, it's, it's a very well-known family. Uh, I forget where it ended up in someone's collection, uh, but a spectacular stone with from the picture you say, what's the big deal? Doesn't look so great. So well, also uh, from I'd love the, for um, you to see it. The lab report, it's a type 2A diamond. Yeah. And that it's, it's a chemically pure type of diamond. And those are associated with the Golconda region in, in India. And that is a very special mine that yeah. produces these diamonds that just have this exceptional color. Uh, and I just wanna bop forward also, because with, with the same collection, with the David Lloyd cufflinks, pearls. And again, you're going to say, why, why, why do I care about these pearls? These are natural pearls. The largest one was just under 13 millimeters. And they, the estimate on these was four to 600,000. And they hammered for about 2.2, uh, they sold all in for $2.2 million in, in the same sale. So the lesson is always take the appointment with the David Webb yeah. couplings. Uh, yeah. But these, again, when it comes to pearls, it, it's these pictures are just not gonna do any justice. There's something about handling them, seeing them in person. And to have a natural pearl over 10 millimeters, that quality was, was exceptional. Um, and, and while we, we can't get into too much provenance, um, the, according to the family history, they, they bought these pieces in France in the 1880s 
and all jewelry, jewelry history buffs out there know the French crown jewelry sale was in 1887. So it's kind of fun to speculate that these could have been pieces from the French crown jewels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, again, you just don't know what you're going to wind up handling uh, in a, in a, in a day, <laughs> in a day, in a day at Skinner. <laughs> Well, I, I think also when you look at this photograph, even though, you know, the photograph is not extraordinary, it's pearls, but if you look at the reflection of each pearl, can you see it? How reflective it is and the, the luster and the sheen of them and the warmth, it, it may not come through, but after handling them, I kind of understand them and, and, and saw them for the beauty. It just took your breath away to see them in person and the match. Do you know how difficult it is to match natural pearls? That means somebody was diving every day for 20 years to try to come up with this strand. It's not easy to do. Certainly not. And, and just for me, it was just holding this, this natural pearl necklace that, that might have been on the neck of Empress Josephine or Marie Antoinette, you don't know. It's, it's, yeah. it's the fantasy. There's a lot about the fantasy too that, that we love. Yeah. Um, and again, I, 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 I've always liked pearls. I think that's another thing we have in common. We love pearls. And there's just something very warm about them. I know they've gone out of fashion and now I believe they're coming back into fashion again. Oh, they're um, in, they're in. They're in, pearls they're are They're back. But yeah. There's something about them. I, I I don't know what it is. They're very warm. Um, you know, I I I've tried. I've tried. I've never been able yeah. to get away with it yet. I call them a gentle way. jewel, John. They're not in your face. You know, they they speak of of um, intellect, of warmth, of you know, of motherliness. You know, the queen mother wears them. You know, I, I just. I, I just think they're, they're lovely. I mean, you would never know that this is a $2, two million <laughs> necklace. Yeah, they're kind of understated. They're yeah. just, just, just a touch, just a touch. 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 Um, yeah. And, and I wear that also with that bracelet, John. I think, I think we have the outfit picked out. <laughs> yeah. I think we do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to I've got try. the earrings, I the bracelet, the necklace. I'm done. I, what more do you need? Yeah. I wish I, no, I, I, not to spoil it, but I didn't pick a tiara, which I'm regretting now, but, um, oh, you know, John, 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 John. <laughs> and then it reminds me when I was, I was buying, uh, uh, some costume jewelry earrings from my, my sister, uh, from that, uh, really great shop on Charles street. I said, are these too much? And he just goes, qu'est-ce que c'est too much? And, and I always think of that. They're closed. The shop, by the way, gone. Oh, don't tell me that. It was too right. much. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was. It was too much. <laughs> and here we are. Um, in the 15 years I've been at 16, 16. Uh, this is the second of two really important carved emeralds that we've sold. And this one, uh, we were able to provenance. This was from the estate of Emily Crane Chadbourne, uh, and she divorced in 1905. And then she moved to Europe and, and she began collecting European and Asian art. And um, a, a lot of her collection is in the Art Institute of Chicago. And this was one of her pieces. Um, and, and these carved emeralds, along with the one we'll get to in a moment, um, I, I find, again, as someone who loves history, art history and, and jewelry, the, the fact that these emeralds were carved in India in the Mughal period, they were, these are Colombian emeralds. They were being mined in Colombia and imported into India in what, the 17th century. I mean, th these, are, these are wonderful things. And, and they still were producing them into the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, but I just think this was probably, what do you think? The pendant of a larger piece of jewelry? Figure like a uh, pearl tassel coming down maybe? Yeah, this was definitely an element. It was not of, an, of itself. Uh, but I did want to point out, John, that a lot of these large carved stones were never the finest, purest material. I mean, it was a very good way of hiding imperfections. I mean, if you really looked at this, you can start to see little imperfections in the stone because how can you get a perfect stone? 
this large and then just carve it. So many times these stones, are, again, are not great examples of the material, but they still have to be pretty intact to be able to carve them. Otherwise, you know, they would be subject to being fractured very quickly. So in this one, you see a lot of areas of it's very clean, but you do see where there are dark spots. Can you see that? Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and Emerald's quite soft. It's, it's amazing yeah. that they were able soft to do this and not, and not break the thing. Um, but, but this we had at 30 to 50,000, because again, how do you estimate this? Uh, sold in 2018 for 243,000. And mm -hmm. I thought this was a nice little segue into this carved emerald, yeah. which I think many people in the jewelry world have seen. We sold that. This was in my first auction when I started in, in 2005. Yeah. Um, and this one, I think, Laura, you have a bit of more history on this yeah, one. Yeah, th this one was a little darker. Can you see that the, the emerald, this is a little more richer color. If you looked at the other one, you'd see that. And the carving is, is quite beautiful. It's, it's got a little frame around it you know, sapphire and little, uh, I think it had a little enamel. It was signed. You can see this is more a finished piece of jewelry, whereas the other one, you know, was missing something. Now, this one was signed Cartier, very lightly in a corner. Uh, we sold it. It came out of a house in actually in Cape Cod family was from Cape Cod. We sold it and I think it, what did it sell for? 275,000. Yeah. And, and then it lay dormant for a while. And then a few years later, maybe six or seven years later, gentleman that bought it passed away. His son uh, took it to a major auction house in New York with a similar name to Skinner that um, uh, said, you know what? We have to authenticate this. We can't sell it as Cartier, Cartier says it's not theirs. So of course they called me and said, well, you guys said it was Cartier. I said, you know what? I feel very confident that it is, but let me do some digging. So I called the um, owners. They, thank God they were still alive, <laughs> quite elderly couple. I said, I need you to think about this. When you got it, how did you get it? Do you have any photographs of anyone in the family wearing this? And she said, you know what? We I had two sisters and maybe each of us got one of these. I said, well, how could there be three? I said, what is your, was your family name? So with the family name, Cartier was able to track it. And they found out that this was part of a sautois. In other words, there were two other carved emeralds and then this one and then a tassel, which was the fashion men and the family broke them apart and gave each sister one. So it all came together uh, with the family name. Cartier was able to track it and all was made good. And my name was not blemished. So I was very <laughs> happy that we it, it was authenticated and sold. I don't remember what it sold for, not that much more, but um, it was a, a wonderful piece of jewelry and, and a lot of jewelry history. We learn from pieces of jewelry. And the body you tell me when I started, you one know, piece at a time. One piece at a time. And I always said, I learned every piece that comes in teaches me something if I want to listen and I want to go further. And these, I mean, these were exhibited in 1925. Who knows if this was in the same place with the Boucheron. I like to think that I do. I, I, I like to think when we get some of these pieces and who owned them and who was wearing them, that this is probably not the same, not the first time that they've ever, they've ever crossed paths, you know? <laughs> um, and yeah. then I think um, that's, that's a bit of jewelry for now, but we're going to go on to, I think the most bizarre, weird, wonderful thing that we've sold is this fantastic brooch of a smoking poodle. We've had two of these. And the first one we sold, I, I was looking at uh, 2008. The original auction estimate was 350 to 450 because it was about 15 penny weights of gold. How much can you estimate a smoking poodle brooch? And it sold for, what did it sell for? $6,250. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and this is just one of those pieces that you cannot possibly predict the outcome at an auction. I mean, it was incredible. We had two poodle collectors, poodle owners, and they had to have it. Were you, a sell you were at the podium at the time, Gloria, right? right? I was selling yeah. and I said, what's going on here? Am I missing something? It must be signs. This must be <laughs> from a famous breeder. I'm not quite sure what's going on. But then of course we had another one a few years later. And it only sold for 1800, something like that. But what it tells you, and I've always told people this, the same thing does not happen twice at an auction. There are different circumstances, different times, different values. So if you have a smoking poodle and at that you come to us and say, oh my God, this one sold for 6,000. Why are you telling me a thousand to 15? Because the same thing doesn't happen twice. And you, you cannot estimate based sheerly on what something sold for. Um, if anybody has any questions in the audience, please feel free to ask us. We yeah, are- we're, we're here. We're, I think now, here. now is the time to open to questions. So yeah. I think on that note, Skinner yeah. events, we can move on to the Q&A portion. Hey. Hi, Julia. Hi. Hi. So we have a lot of people asking some great questions. We do have about 10 minutes left, so we'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, so, you know, one question is, do you two collect jewelry? And if so, what are those items? What are you the most proud of? John, you collect, you're in the real collecting stage. Am I? Um, I like, personally, I've always liked, uh, ca well, cameo jewelry. Uh, there's something to me that's just so sculptural about it. it. It For me, it combines what I love about art history, sculpture, decorative arts, and jewelry. And I, I do think cameos can be very underrated. I think that um, it's it's such a skill to be able to do that in the various mediums and shell and, and stone. Um, but I, I tend to gravitate towards any kind of cameo jewelry. And in general, brooches. I love brooches. I know for a while they were a little bit out, but for me, I think they're the easiest thing to wear. I can wear one on a suit jacket when I wear suits again. I think it's been a year at this point. Um, but, but even now you can just throw it onto a sweater. They're the easiest thing to wear. They can dress up or dress down as the case may be any outfit. Um, so that's, that's my, my jewelry taste for the most part. I, I will get into maybe a pearl necklace every once in a while, but why not? I'll try. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting because I've collected over the years, usually just things that I, I can't live without. I just love them. Um, I, and one of the things I like are dress clips. I, these are some that I collected over the years, something about them. They're easy to wear, they fit on everything. Um, I love color, colored stones, of course. Um, and then what do I find myself wearing now? I'm wearing one coral pendant drop that was a, a set of earrings that my mother lost the other one. So I said, I'm gonna polish this and wear it. And, and it's, it's jewelry starts to become personal and sentimental all of a sudden. But, you know, I, I like the whole gamut. I like contemporary, doesn't matter to me. I like things that are well-designed, well thought of, that just grab me. That, um, and I also like things I can wear. You know, I, I don't always necessarily want to buy something that I won't wear. Like I'd wear those big Cartier flat diamond earrings. I wear that bracelet, you know, it, it, it's something that I would love. Great. Thank you. So the next question is, um, if I have jewelry I don't wear, what is the best way to know um, what the right time to sell is and whether, you know, somebody should sell their items or not? Hmm. So they want to know about timing. That's a good question. Uh, is there a right time? Over the years, I've been here, what, over 40 years. It's always the right time. If you are not wearing it and you want to move on, then you sell it. You cannot time a market. It, 
unless you're dealing in a specific, like a diamond stone that has a given price, you know, where markets go up and down. But with jewelry, if you are done with it and you're not enjoying wearing it, why hold on to it? Buy yourself something that you're going to wear. So I say the right time is every day come see us. We'll tell you what we think. Great. Um, so what is the most expensive piece of Boston arts and crafts jewelry Skinner has sold? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, arts and crafts. I remember a hail necklace that was on the cover 40, well, at that time 41,000 was a extraordinary price. That we it was had... a big, long necklace fringe was on the cover of a, of a sale. And at that time, that was the highest price for, again, a piece that had no jewels in it. You know, we're talking about sheer design and period and the maker. And I don't know if we had anything that brought more than 41 or 42,000. What did the I Joseph Bean remember. Hartwell Shaw bring? That was wonderful. And the silver with the amethysts. Um, we can look, but that that was a great piece. I too. would say you're looking, you know, I, I don't know of anything selling, uh, you know, again, over 50,000 at this point. Because most arts and crafts jewelry is not about the jewels. You know, you may get into other arts and crafts pieces where someone took stones and used them, expensive stones, like I've seen diamond necklaces, but those never reach because uh, that's not what arts and crafts was about. We'd have to research it more. I know one that we sold was 41,000 many years ago. Great. Um, are there any styles or types of jewelry that you think are undervalued at the moment? That's a good question. I don't know, Gloria, how are you feeling about retro? I've kind of been feeling, kind of getting into it more than I used to. I, I just like the big, bold gold work and the, some of the colors that you see. Um, it's, it can be, I think, I think that that could be a little underrated right now. Well, I, th I think when I think about retro, what, what happens in the market is a lot of the retro jewelry was not met well made. It was big. Yes, because the style design was big, but they were sometimes very flimsy and light. And if you turn them over, tinny. they're tinny, tinny and they're not made well. So are they undervalued? Yes, the great retro jewelry is, but that's hard to find what I would consider really great retro. I mean, Cartier retro jewelry is fantastic. We have a dress clip coming up, a uh, single dress clip in citrines that is beautifully made. but generally speaking, retro jewelry in this country, in South America, you, you, we get a lot of that. They're not particularly well-made. And I think that's what's hurt them over the years is they're showy on top, you flip them over, not so great. We like to look at the back. Many times when I see a piece of jewelry, the first thing I do is turn it over and see what does it look like on the back? How does it feel? How is it made? So. Is retro undervalued? Yeah, if you can find great retro jewelry, yes, I think it's undervalued. Um, I'm thinking what else that I would say, artist design jewelry, I think that market is strong, but we're seeing more and more young artists coming into the market. Um, but I think great jewelry, it's all about great design. Really, that, that's what it's all about, undervalued, I think with the internet and everyone having so much knowledge, it's hard to find that one little thing that's undervalued. I think you have to judge the design of it. You have to be a good design interpreter, in my opinion. Cameos maybe, John, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I, I think great cameos are undervalued. It, 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 actually, I, I disagree. I think the great ones still bring- Oh, the great money. ones, yeah. But yeah. I do, I, I, I completely agree. I think some of the, some of the mid-level cameos say, I, I would agree. Yes, they, they're certainly yeah. undervalued. Yeah. But thanks, Joe. What's next? Um, so that being said, what is your dream piece to have walk through our doors? Like you would just fall to the floor. You're just so <laughs> in love. You've made it. 
Well, well actually, John, you t- uh, something came in the door last week. That's a great piece of antique diamond earrings. Because those are hard to come by. did actually come in the door. Um, I don't know, Julie, do we want to uh, go back to the slideshow real quick? Sure, I believe you would just have to share your screen with us. Sure, I can do that. Here we are. Um, when you talk about things coming in the door, oops, just needs a moment for, needs, needs a moment to warm back up. But I think I, I would have to, to answer the question, I may have to go with the, the, what we still consider the holy grail of jewelry, the Cartier Art Deco Tutti Frutti bracelet. I, I think that still, for me, would, would just be the drop dead piece. Um, but I don't know anymore. <laughs> no, but definitely, definitely Cartier Art Deco. I, I, I think that in that period, Cartier is, 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 is peerless. I, I really do. Um, let's see. I'll try again. It's being shy now. Yeah. Well, that just means that everyone's going to have to come back to our May right. sale. May sale. And you can see the surprises that just walked in the door. Mm-hmm. But um, Gloria, what do you think? What 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 are you still waiting for? I'm trying to think. If there's f- anything left for me that I've seen over oh. the years, John? What did I see? I've knocked off my five top items already that I've seen so far. But you know what? You never know what tomorrow will bring. Who's gonna come in with something fantastic? Uh, oh yeah, I know what I'm waiting for. That ruby. Oh, that yeah. ruby. Uh, there was yes. a ruby that I saw 25 years ago that I'm still hoping to be my last <laughs> item. <laughs> to sell at Skinner is a really extraordinary colored stone. That's what I'm hoping for. Okay, I'll be in tomorrow, John. Okay, sounds good. I think I think on that note, Julie, do we do we have time for one more question? We do have time for you know one more question. Would you like me sure. to give it to you? Do you have one in mind? I don't, but let's um let's uh we can we can leave the smoking poodle behind. Okay, let me. <laughs> All and, right. and, yeah, we can we can feel another one. Okay, so the last one is: Would you say that big house jewelers such as Tiffany, Cartier, etc., um, always hold their value and make better investment if you are a young jewelry collector? It's a good question. It's a tough one. Um, Gloria, do you want to take this one first? Well, I think what you have to think about of these big jewelers, you know, years ago when people were collecting Cartier, Tiffany, Van Cleef, um, they didn't have that commercial side of them. And the internet has made those houses produce jewelry that easily is replicable. In other words, they can make multiples and that people know, oh, this is a X by Cartier and I know what it is and is, are those pieces that have been, I want to say mass produced in some way, really, that's what they were. Um, are those going to hold their value? I think they'll be okay. I don't see them really going sky high, like the pieces we showed, which were really rare, creative pieces of jewelry. So what you're seeing in the market, yes, like Elsa Peretti just died, and she was a fantastic jeweler for Tiffany. And yes, will her things go up in value? Right now they will, no question about it. People will be looking to her iconic styles to want to buy them. And those definitely have legs, as I say, you know, the bone cuff bracelets, which over the years we sold well, sometimes they were lower, higher. I think you're going to see them really take, take off now. I think if you're buying designers within a design house, those will continue to go up because they were not so mass produced, but it depends what you're buying. I mean, are you buying jewelry to go up in value? I would buy a gold coin. You know, I, I think you should buy jewelry to wear it and enjoy it and not think so much about, will it go up in value? You've enjoyed it. It's going to have some value, right? When you go to sell it, it may not be worth double what you paid, but, What's the price of enjoying it for 10, 20 years and having it? 
And then on that note, if anyone ever does want to have jewelry evaluated by Skinner, we are always available. Uh, you can contact us at the website. You can email us at jewelry at skinnerinc.com or you can contact me or Gloria directly. We would be very happy to evaluate your collections or single items. Um, we, we, as you can tell, we, we enjoy looking at jewelry. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say it never really gets boring. It, it, really, it really doesn't. We, we, we truly love, uh, I think my favorite appointment is someone that comes in with a, a jewelry box that's just a mess. It's, it's a mess. And, and we have to untangle all of the different pieces from, from generations. And, and it's like a, it's like a treasure hunt. And, and I think that that for me is, is my favorite thing to do. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at your jewelry anytime. Yeah. And you can even just send us a picture online to the jewelry inbox and we all look at it and uh, someone will get back to you or just make an appointment, come in. Uh, we are now fully masked and I'm fully vaccinated and John's vaccinated. So uh, we're ready to go. We are vaccinated and ready to serve you. Ready with all to your go. Jewelry Here we are. <laughs> well, right. unless Julie, do you have anything else for no, us? Not at all. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Gloria. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and uh, happy holidays to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, check back in our online sale. It's uh, bidding goes until 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay. Thanks again. Great. Thank